Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to the Nausicast, the cast where we finish talking about every movie made by Studio Ghibli. And um, we are now currently going back through the history of the two main Studio Ghibli directors and covering their career leading up to Ghibli. Today we are back at the big man himself, Hayao Miyazaki, who was just recently blessed, blessed with another Academy Award. Isn't that right, Platon? Oh yeah, that was a that, that was a great uh, great time to be watching the Oscars. He didn't uh, even need to show up though. The balls nope, on this didn't, man didn't even care. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he he did not show up in uh, in two thousand three uh, to pick up his uh, his Academy Award for Spirited Away, partly in. Uh, I believe in protest over the Iraq war. So uh, there's that, that there's the possibility that this is a similar situation. On the other hand, he is also an extremely old guy to be flying uh, halfway across the world for like one night uh, of a, uh, for a thing awards. he in real life probably doesn't care that much about being honest. I mean, he's yeah. also a pretty old man to still be directing like Academy award winning animation features, but yeah. <laughs> um, but leaving that aside, that's our update on the how do you live situation for now. Um, today, we're not talking about how do you live, but we travel back in time to the year 1979. And that rhymed uh, very, very good to talk about um, something we've already touched on a little bit in the Panda Kapanda episode, where we mentioned that Miyazaki also spent some time working on the Lupin the Third franchise. Today we're talking about the second feature film of that franchise, Lupin the Third Castle of Cagliostro, which Miyazaki uh, not only directed, but he was also the writer, this, one of the two writers, though I'm told that the other writer didn't have much of a say, uh, a character designer, storyboarders, and so on. Like, he basically, uh, one man showed uh, the entire, you know, uh, lead roles of the movie, except for the animation director, taken over by Otsuka, who, as we know, has a lot of experience directing the animation in the Lupin the Third franchise. With me today to cover this uh, historic occasion of Miyazaki's first uh, directorial debut on a movie are uh, Platon Skull. Hello. Uh, that's me, Platon Skull, or just Platon. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, uh, and I am here to uh, to say that uh, where, whenever you spot a weird ch car chase going on, the correct answer uh, to who you're on the side of is obviously the lady in the dress. That's just basic manners. Basic logic. And hipster Cthulhu. I'm here as well, uh, he, him. And yeah, it's always good to just uh, join in car chases, you know. The police can't catch all of you. And lastly, also involved in this car chase is me, Nyard, he, him. And yeah, let's get right into it. So the first thing we should probably touch upon is what Miyazaki has been up to between Panda Copanda and this, because uh, he is a busy, busy man. And uh, even though this podcast here only covers um, movies for, you know, logistics reasons, because it's easier to compactly talk and do our kind of close analysis of movies over TV shows, which tend to be, well, just a lot longer, a lot more material and a lot more episodic plots with their own themes and stuff just doesn't work for a format. But it is worth mentioning all of the uh, TV works that uh, Miyazaki has been involved in in the meantime, or rather the most important ones, uh, which would be uh, Heidi, Girl of the Alps, which uh, Miyazaki worked in as designer for uh, backgrounds and layouts, uh, which was directed by Sao Takahata. Uh, 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother, also, again, scene design and layout, layout directed by Sao Takahata. And in 1978, a big premiere for uh, Miyazaki's own, you know, work is Future Boy Conan, a TV series that he directed, finally. Um, I think all of us here have seen Future Boy Conan. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, uh, great show. Uh, fantastic animation, particularly for, uh, like, a TV show at that era. Like we said, with... Uh... Panic or Panda, you wouldn't really expect that kind of quality for like sort of a simple special and same for Future Boy Conan. You could really see him sort of like coming to his own as a director in it. I, I didn't uh, see the entire series, unfortunately. I think I got about halfway through. Um, I think like in terms of like really old animation, uh, 
requires a level of like uh so, some diligence and patience uh with the with the pacing and stuff that uh I didn't have in me at, at the time but I I should definitely return to it uh, at some point soon it definitely had uh, I think it had uh, unusually long episodes I think the episodes were all like 28 to 30 minutes right like am I misremembering that I don't think I am um the interesting thing about Future by Conan, uh, just briefly at this point in time, is how many of the typical Miyazaki tropes uh, are established here and referenced later in other movies and series as well. I believe in the course of the podcast, we've touched upon some of these overlaps uh, here and there, but uh, some facts to mention is it's like a steampunk influenced post-apocalyptic world which is kind of reminiscent of stuff going on in Nausicaa and Castle in the Sky with like its big robots the main duo is like an upbeat um, you know adventurous tough boy who is like brave and faces all the challenges with his big big stick I believe <laughs> um, and and a girl who is very much reminiscent of the main girl in Castle in the Sky so like just numerous uh, little overlaps that uh, seem to be brought back as interesting callbacks later on uh, throughout the career but uh, today is not the day we talk about uh, Future by Conan today is the day we talk about what came after it which is Lupin the Third Part uh, two. No, we're not part two. Um, Miyazaki and Takahara also directed some episodes of Lupin the Third, part two. But we're talking about Lupin the Third, The Castle of Cagliostro, a movie that uh, Miyazaki was a pro approached to direct after, you know, already having had some experience directing for the franchise, as we talked about in the Panda Copana episode. Just a brief recap here. The first Lupin the Third series uh, was released in 1971. And Lupin the Third is a franchise based on a manga by a mangaka named Monkey Punch, uh, his art, his artist's name, and it's a series with decidedly mature themes. It features the grandson of uh, the Maurice LeBlanc character Arsène Lupin, the gentleman thief, uh, who is unlike the gentleman thief uh, that that you know uh, Maurice LeBlanc's character was, quite a bit of a villain. So the, the the manga series especially is characterized by its darker themes, sexual themes, violence, chauvinism, hedonism, you know, disregard for basically uh, morality, let's put it like that. So a very mature manga, manga series from the 60s that was being adapted in 1971. And uh, it was a very messy, uh, I want to say not very successful adaptation as well. It was clearly troubled by animation errors and awkward pacing and staff changes uh, halfway through because the series was underperforming. Uh, the uh, producers organized that the old director is fired from the project and Miyazaki and Takahata take over instead. And as soon as they took over, they gradually introduced changes to the series that kind of deeply changed how some of the characters operated uh, and how the tone was and the amount of sexual content and violence and so on was seriously reduced. So that makes mm. watching the first series of Lupin the Third um, a very messy affair. Like you can tell watching the series that there's something going on there that it wasn't quite what it was meant to be. But can I just quickly yeah. um, push back on one thing that uh, having a bunch of like sexism and cross humor does not necessarily make a work mature um, um but i i do understand what you were saying that that is adult oriented intended yeah uh, adult oriented uh, as we, uh, as we could say the, through... the intention was for it to be more mature not necessarily in execution we could say as we could say through ratings it would be a m for mature you know <laughs> That, that 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 kind of mature, so I think that's the video game rating. Yeah, probably. The, the I don't know. Rated R <laughs> for restricted or <laughs> NC seventeen in the worst cases. Which, to be fair, the mystery of Mama movie, which we'll get to soon, that 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 would get an NC seventeen, I think. So, uh, yeah. So let let's just put it like that. It was unusual as a manga of the time to be targeting an adult audience. So whether or not. The way the adult audience was targeted was put on in a tasteful or mature in terms of like maturity way. Um, and that's arguable. Probably not, right? Um, but it was an early case of a very edgy, over-the-top, violent action schlock series. 
And I guess that's the context that's important to keep in mind when thinking about this franchise. Okay, but... So we, we, we've covered the first season. The series went on to have a surprising return uh, a few years later when the second season of the series was being uh, animated. Part 2 uh, started airing in October uh, 1977. And unlike the first series, which uh, was cancelled after just 23 episodes, uh, just two se seasons of seasonal anime, basically, um, the, the second season ran on for a very long time and became a beloved classic show that basically established all of the action trope, all of its central characters, you know, really had that more whimsical action appeal hard-coded into it and a lot of the more uh, mature or adult themed elements removed from it and in the context of that success of the second series there was the production of um, uh, you know feature films to kind of capitalize on that so in 1978 the uh, loop on the third the mystery of mammal uh, was made not by miyazaki or anyone uh, uh, relevant to, to our uh, podcast necessarily, but um, it exists. And Platon, in preparation, you watched at least a bit of it. How did it go? Yeah, uh, that movie is an absolute disaster in terms of plotting. Uh, I uh, the, uh, the the tone is extremely crass. The uh, like Lupin is extremely unlikable in it in much of it. And I, 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 I basically felt like I had to I, I I could not keep watching anymore. I had to stop watching after I realized that it was like five or ten minutes after they had confronted the main antagonist in their evil lair and destroyed the lair and kill and killed the bad guys and left. And there was still like half an hour of the movie left, and then the villain did did some returning thing. It it was really really a s strange thing to watch, but also great in terms of perspective because it's only a year older than uh, Cagliostro and and holy crap like Cagliostro just blows it out of the water on like uh, most levels I'd say I I only vaguely remember watching it because I I, I I've been immersed in the Lupin the Third franchise for uh, quite a while probably like the last eight or nine years I've been watching a lot of stuff here and there but Mystery of Mamo was very early on and I don't remember hating it, but um, <laughs> maybe taste also matures over time, just like Lupin did uh, to uh, foreshadow a little bit of the development happening in Castle of Cagliostro. But even if you didn't like it very much, uh, Platon, Mystery of Marmo was a surprising box office hit. Released in December 16th, uh, 1978, um, the sequel would follow exactly one year later, December 15th, 1979. So like... Well, almost exactly one year, one day off. But whatever the case is, there's a quick turnaround here. And the surprising fact to learn is that the success of Mamo led immediately to production considering, well, I guess we need a sequel. We got to ride that, ride that wave. We need another one. And um, in terms of that project, um, it is uh, said that uh, Yasuo Otsuka, uh, who you know worked before with Miyazaki on uh, Lupin the Third, uh, the first season, thought, well, my old buddy, uh, I I could ask him, I could bring him back to work on the sequel, uh, because Otsuka was also animation director on uh, Mystery of Mamo. So uh, already, you know, part of the production team said, well, let's ask our guy Miyazaki, figure out if he wants to do it, and turns out, yes, he was interested in that, and uh, which is. Sort of surprising because he was a really, really fresh director at this point. Future Boy Conan was his first directorial uh, work in 1978. And he was kind of like still involved in the production of uh, Future Boy Conan at the time that he was being approached, if I'm not mistaken, because production schedules of anime are like the, C the, the series started in 1978 and it went on, uh, I think to conclude either at the end of 1978 or even a bit deeper into um, 1979. Um, can't confirm that right now. But he was approached and he said, yes, um, the one condition basically was that he would be able to do with it what he wanted. And that he would do. Oh, that he would do. 
because uh, as I mentioned earlier, he took on not only multiple roles at once, like as storyboard artist, director, and co-writer, but also it's been reported that he uh, basically, uh, his co-writer, Haruya Yamazaki, um, apparently most of his ideas were rejected by Miyazaki. <laughs> And Miyazaki just ignored them and wrote the entire thing himself. That's at least how it is reported, yeah. I, I believe I read that the, the, the co-writer was um, mostly there for, like, the specifically Lupin the Thirds, like, stuff, like, the like character details and, and, and the like, which, in which case it would make sense that they're, like, uh, Miyazaki would be in a lot more control since, as you've already alluded to, like, the characters are, like, a, quite a bit different in uh, in in this uh, in this version than uh, than in the original uh, manga and uh, and early iterations, yeah, and you know as alluded to already, you know they were approached after the success of Marmo, so there was a total of seven and a half months from the project's conception to the final product, and you know in those seven and a half months, um, not all of that is animation time. So a lot of it is, you know, hiring people, setting up contracts, organizing, you know, planning and so on. So the actual time worked on animating this film. Uh, it was finished in November. Uh, it was debuted in December. It was four to five months, roughly, for a cinematic feature. So uh, anecdotes describe that some of these people basically lived in the studio, just sleeping there, going into work every day. Through, soldiering through this intense and insane production. Uh, Miyazaki remarks that uh, he first learned the limits of his own physical strength with this work. And you can tell, like, this shot I mean, of the production frame, yeah. If Miyazaki is telling you that, like, yeah, this, this made him hit his limits, <laughs> then uh, then it, it must have been insane. But, like, even setting aside that, like, obviously, like, four months of crunch time is uh pretty insane um even so it, it's in an incredible like production achievement that what came out of it at the other end is such a cohesive and consistent work um which uh, just huge credit to like the production team and to Miyazaki as a, as a director like steering a a massive ship going so many knots or whatever the <laughs> the, the term is um that is that is, cannot have been easy i think it also makes sense that uh after this miyazaki would seek to create his own studio because um i don't exactly remember that what happened with norsegore is sort of an independent production they got picked up and then of, of course after that they would make uh, studio ghibli where Miyazaki and Takahata would be in control of their own productions instead of having to do something absolutely deranged like this in, in the space of about four to five months. Someone should make a podcast uh, series about uh, that. Chron chronicling that studio's journey, yeah, that would be an idea. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, but as you two also mentioned, like, damn, this is a decent-looking movie. It's uh, well-animated, you know, it's not up to the highest standards that Ghibli would set later on, but it's definitely one of the highest standards set at the time in terms of Japanese animation, you know. At the time, what are the comparable movies even? Like, uh, we have, like, artsy stuff like Belladonna of Sadness, which, you know, is not really in the same ballpark. We have, like, franchise tie-in movies like Galaxy Express 999, uh, Panda Ko Panda, <laughs> obviously, you know, the short films made by Miyazaki and Takahata before this. The... Uh, different animal-themed uh, toy movies like Animal Treasure Island or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Puss in Boots, there was an adaptation there that uh, there was some involvement by Miyazaki as well, I think, in terms of animation. But that's basically the, the status of, uh, you know, feature films and animation at the time in Japan. There, there were some, you know, definitely great works there i'm thinking about the aim for the ace movie which marks a fantastic uh, uh you know direction work by osamu dezaki but in terms of you know vibrant fast-paced animation fluidity and so on lupin the third castle of cagliostro really <laughs> set a kind of benchmark i would say um, of course, like the, the old school anime otaku might uh, appear in the comment section and say, well, you idiot, you forgot about this movie, which looks way better than uh, Castle of Cagliostro. And I thank you for suggesting this uh, for my consideration. 
But it is worth noting that you would have to look relatively hard to find movies as animated and as expressive as Castle of Cagliostro in this era. So even if there are others, which granted there might be, I don't know every movie released in the era, um, this is still a quite impressive feat, especially considering how much better it looks than Mystery of Mammal and considering how short the production time frame on this actually yeah. was. Put that down for another W in a long career of Ws for Miyazaki. It was a W, but interestingly enough, not a box office success. Uh, not initially, at least. Um, the film would go on to build its legacy, you know, to become influential, not just in Japan, but in the West as well. And it would go on to, you know, see numerous releases internationally, starting in the 90s and later with different translations and, you know, uh, different home releases. But originally, not the greatest success. So, you know... It is what it is. Sometimes we had a surprising number of movies uh, in in this podcast where we could say that it wasn't a huge box office success where we still came away with the conclusion that it's an excellent movie. So, you know, what can you do? It's just what it is. I, I will say maybe it, it might actually have suffered from being a direct sequel a year later to a very messy movie. Uh, I, I, I can imagine a... a you know, situation where the audience that came out in big numbers to see like the first Lupin the third theatrical movie because they're fans of the franchise and then it was a bit of a mess and then a year later oh, here's another one and it's like Meh, may maybe not this time the, this could be part of it but uh, another part that I think is a significant factor in this is that uh, Miyazaki uh, and his approach to writing these characters in the tone of the series isn't exactly what fans of the series were expecting so we already kind of discussed that the series has these much more darker edgier roots and Miyazaki completely departs from them and in ways which we will be discussing at length in this podcast I think because it's one of the most interesting things about this film but one thing that is definitely clear is that there were angry otaku at the time who liked Lupin the Third as it was in the manga, as it was in the first series, and were not happy <laughs> about Miyazaki going ahead and changing everything about the franchise they knew and liked. You know, right? That, that makes sense. That like this is pretty much like a family flick. Uh, like it's got some serious like themes and uh, and some like gun violence and stuff. That might not fly everywhere, uh, but you you can you can watch this with the kids and it's it's fine. Yeah, it's like an which also might flavor. have been why it didn't do super well because you people might have thought, oh, Lupin, that series about a guy who just like kills people and steals shit, is that for kids? And then the fans of Lupin, like you said, didn't might not have vibed with it as much. Which is, which so, is it, it's pretty ironic because uh, when it, it got picked up in the West, we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail later. But um, but uh, uh, John Lasseter, who was like the first big like uh, proponent for Studio Ghibli uh, out in like the Western animation world, specifically noted how fascinated he was to see something that that was, was for adults. That's part of what he he thought was so incredible about what he saw from from this movie was that oh they they figured out that they they they're making animation that's not just for little children that's great and ironically this is actually the more child friendly version yeah of uh, of Lupin uh, but I digress so wrapping up a little bit on the production side um, just a few more notes on the production schedule so the setting. And the castle itself, the eponymous castle of Cagliostro, were actually the first things Miyazaki designed. So the first thing he did was he started drawing a bird's eye view of the lake, the castle, and, you know, the surrounding area of this very small European pseudo Monaco or pseudo Liechtenstein uh, yeah, kind it's, of it's, it's a fictional microstate. Yeah, yeah, a fictional microstate based around like an old European uh, dynasty and whatnot, you know. So he started. But if I had to guess yeah. from the scenery, I'd say maybe Switzerland, because we know that uh, Mizaki spent a lot of time there when they were doing research for Heidi at the Alps. So maybe. Yeah, Liechtenstein might be the closest. Liechtenstein equivalent, but like. A, but like there's a coast as well. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, though I, w I do want to say there is like a real iconic scene from uh, Goldfinger, which I'm not even sure if Mizaki's seen, but like the connection to like Bond and Lupin the Third, 
is always there and like there's like a real iconic scene of him going down into this really deep valley in Switzerland that is almost exactly like the shot as they come in through into the Cagliostro country. That could definitely be the case. Um, I think the James Bond vibes are strong in this one. Um, we'll probably mention it here and there, but like Lupin is like a like an agent type, you know, he has like gadgets and weird stuff like a crank in his belt buckle that has like an extending grappling hook that he can reel in and stuff like cool stuff like that it did give me james bond vibes uh, i say someone who's never seen a james bond movie uh, shame on me um i uh, uh while we're at the set uh, setting parts uh, just a quick note i believe that they are using the like italian pronunciation yeah. of the, the the gl so it's caliostro like uh yeah caliostro not cagliostro yes i think the japanese uh like uh like text will we'll also bear that out there's no g sound in it that's true but i will fail at the pronunciation of this thing the entire way through i'm sorry in, in advance especially to all right our italian fans. i just wanted to make sure that our <laughs> listeners know that this yeah. is on purpose and out of spite yes. and not an on accident yes okay. we do know the right way we just refuse like... yes um Caliostro. Okay, let's try. Let's try. Let's see. Um, so what's interesting to me is the first thing that was wrong was the layout of the place. And if you watch the movie, it makes a lot of sense because this place, this space is used in every, every way. Like it is riddled with like little set pieces and sequences of ascent and descent of jumping, climbing, you know, of um, um, passing through like hidden pathways and so on that all fit neatly into this architecture. So it makes sense that Miyazaki, as it's reported, started out with like a sketch of the castle and surrounding area and then figured, okay, how do I put a adventure and, you know, adventurous story in this? And you can really tell it kind of reminds me of a, a, like like a weird example outside of our usual wheelhouse, but you know how it said that in Dark Souls, the map of Arnor Londo was designed in advance and then the level was built into it. And you can feel that when you play it, that it's kind of different from the level design up to that point because the environment already existed and then they put the story in it. You know what I mean? That's what well, yeah, you have here um, as well. Bo both, both famous... Um, um, genius masterpiece creators miyazaki's uh, oh true very good <laughs> understanding of space not and the think, same yeah, this, miyazaki. This really shows. <laughs> not, not the same miyazaki but both really appreciate using space in a narrative and like allowing that to like really be used within the, the re each medium and the way miyazaki has the castle in this movie yeah really communicates this idea of like it's a place like we we get to see maps of it from above and then characters move in and around it and you always feel like you know where you are and you understand the the sort of tension with being high and then being low yeah i think i think it's also part of the secret to why the um uh the the quick turnaround on on the movie how everything works uh is that so much of the movie takes place around the same setting and having that established very early on and uh and, and everything going from from there so you you don't need like background artists to make backgrounds for like three different set piece areas, like uh, like like a, a different story might. Uh, there's a number of advantages to it, but but yes, as you said, like the sense of space is really important. And one of the standout parts of the movie is the the castle itself. It's it's so like iconic and uh and and lively you can almost like map it out in your brain after watching it and it, it even ties together with the, like one of the central mysteries of the movie turns out actually to be a mystery of the setting itself of the placement of the castle and the aqueduct it all becomes like a little mystery box of its own it's really you clear clever. out the water to find the new level it's just like dark Souls. it is you do exactly you do exactly <laughs> um also, if you just Google Swiss castles like I just did, uh, you'll find things that look <laughs> almost exactly like examples used for the like reference of the construction of the castle. Yeah, well, it, totally. except with like a, like three hundred percent more spires and towers. Yeah, yeah. Like, what if it was like uh, yeah, yeah, way higher? But, you know, you gotta make it look dramatic. You gotta make it look cool as fuck on a big hill. Yeah, and and on that point. Um... Different writers have pointed out that they were also fascinated by the depictions of European architecture through this lens. Helen McCarthy, for example, says Cagliostro takes place in the never, never land that is the Japanese dream of Europe. Uh, that's an interesting quote. Um, 
another uh, um, uh, Cavallaro writes that uh, it is a version of Europe as seen through Eastern eyes, the Acogare no Paris, the Paris of our dreams, uh, even though it's not Paris, but you know. So the setting itself seems to be a vivid imagination of Europeanness seen through the lens of a different culture, you know, a fascination with that kind of architecture, which is noteworthy because usually we see it the other way around, you know, Western directors imagining a usually bastardized uh, racist version of the East, you know, <laughs> Orientalism and all that stuff. Here we have the reverse and I, I think we can take it. We, we, we can enjoy this. This is cool. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, Mizaki himself even said um, in his own book, talking about Lupin, sort of looking back at the times, how it was sort of an era where everyone was obsessed with Europe, like uh, Japan was importing a lot of European cars, a lot of European music. There was sort of this counterculture based around, you know, the American 60s counterculture that was really strong in Japan when Lupin was becoming um, a really big series at the end of the 60s. There was sort of this, you know, cosmopolitan Japan trying to integrate itself culturally into like the swinging, you know, vibrant Europe of the time. I feel like Lupin is a good example of that because while he is Japanese as a character, he is of descendant of like a famous French character. So there's sort of like this uh, yeah. bridging two worlds. I was about to say like, is was is is Lupin disguising himself as that uh, as that priest? um in, in in the climax of the film is that like a sort of reverse yellow face situation <laughs> because i seem to remember there's like this one james bond movie where like sean connery goes undercover as a a japanese person and it's extremely That's offensive in, uh yeah you only live twice which is yeah. a fantastic movie but yes he does <laughs> pretend to be japanese so he can infiltrate a volcano fortress well, I guess uh, and he I also guess... trains in the ways of a ninja and becomes a true samurai. So you know he's he's very culturally respected. Both at once when he puts on the fake eyelids. In the... Oh God! <laughs> no. Well, I, I guess Lupin oh. got got revenge for that yeah. in, the, yeah. in this movie. It's definitely a strange case of you know how the stories are very often set like in Europe and European looking places and even throughout the franchise history, but all of its lead characters are you know, called Fujiko, Jigen, Goemon, and uh, fucking uh, Senikata, you know. So Lupin, even though he retains the French name, is also like heavily, heavily implied to be Japanese. Interestingly, in terms of the lore of the story, there are like six or seven origin stories of how the gang met and, you know, formed the gang. And all of them exist at the same time and none of them is canonical. So it's like a huge meme to keep inventing new origin stories for them. <laughs> So, like, we don't well, actually they, know if Lupin is supposed to, G supposed to be Japanese or not, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean they, they hand wave the language barriers uh, throughout because it's just inconvenient. Like, yeah. like a sci-fi movie where everyone just, all the aliens speak English. D don't worry about it. Just let's let's move on. Though there are jokes about, you know, Japanese people in this movie. Like, for example, the guards of the Cagliostro castle, you know. Uh, uh, say to Zenigata that oh no we don't need help from an oriental like you like at least in one of the translations that I saw um, believe they yeah, could yeah, differ by that. translation yeah there are like two different dubs for this movie and I think like three different sub translations so you can really take your pick yeah it's wild like I, I, I if we see these like even in German right there's two different dubs we have two different dubs one uh, which is like more faithful and more modern, and one which had like which in which Lupin was called Hardy Man. I, I, I don't <laughs> in the original English dub, he's <laughs> called Wolf, not Lupin, because I guess yeah. is Lupin the French word for wolf. I would assume. Um, there's or probably a, some re linguistic relation because of lupus, right? The Latin word yeah, for wolf. Yeah, I, I assumed it was something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah they also changed some of the references in the script for the, that dub version to be a bit more family friendly. The references to like, I don't know, like murder. And um, for some reason, in one of the s translations, uh, Clarice is said to have been in a in a convent for the past like few years. Yeah. But then they say in school, in the, oh, the English. Like a oh, convent know, school, a convent right? too spicy. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> to bring like, up. oh, she just got out of school. Why would you know that? You're okay. No, uh, I speaking, guess the uh, convent is this... implies sort of virgin, virginality to her. Yeah, maybe. The movie didn't want to. Is, is this the right time to talk about Cliffhanger? The arcade game? Go ahead. Yeah, so the first actual, like, dub of, I think, the entire Lupin franchise 
is a 1983 arcade Laserdisc video game called Cliff Hanger, which combines footage from The Mystery of Marmo, the first movie, and uh, this one, The Castle of Cagliostro, to like make a like sort of adventure game, um, sort of I like think, a Dragon's Lair style. Yeah, like, like FMV game. Yeah, I think that that's the idea. Uh, apparently, there's this, there's even there's a scene in The Goonies where like one of the characters is playing this very game, uh, just like uh, before something else happens in the scene and stuff. Uh, th- this is like wild to me. Apparently, they like. They tried to get some, like, like some festival screenings, see if there was interest in out in the West, uh, and they, nothing really caught on. Uh, and so, like that was like the the way to make money out in the West in nineteen the start nineteen eighties. Apparently, was to just make a, a an arcade video game adventure out of it. Just really wild stuff. What's what's fascinating here about this story is that nowadays we take it for granted that we can just watch all of these animated movies from the 60s and 70s in Japan. But at the time, it was pretty much impossible to get your hands on these. Like, there were no translations, there were no cinematic releases, there were no, you know, uh, uh, VHS tapes uh, subtitled in Hong Kong that only started in the 80s when you had poorly translated VHS tapes making their way to American and Western markets. So even though there was like a vibrant animation culture there in Japan, uh, there was basically no way it could cross-saminate into, you know, other animation cultures until, and maybe this is the point where we actually start talking about John Lasseter. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this movie actually marks the beginning of, you know, Western attention on Hayao Miyazaki uh, as a a worker and and, and maybe like... uh, anime more broadly but that, that that would be a much bigger statement so let's not go there um but yes uh, as you mentioned uh, john lasseter who at, at this time uh, in like 1980 ish uh is uh, an animator at uh, at walt disney studios um mostly you know a, a workman uh, animator trying to you know pitch projects and uh, and the like uh, he comes across uh, this uh, film, or at the very least, uh, he gets his hands on a uh, a clip reel uh, of this movie, and it's like kind of blows his mind, like seeing this um, animation that can like is is clearly intended for not just kids but uh, the adult audience as well, uh, and all this kinetic energy in it. And this was a time, a, a period where the um, the American animation industry was kind of in a in a weird sp- space. Uh, um, like Walt Disney's uh, animation department had uh, is, was kind of in a uh, in a bit of a crisis that would be at its very worst in the mid eighties. Uh, Walt Disney had died at the end of the sixties, and the seventies were a bit messy with uh, stuff like uh, I think Aristocats would be one of the more recent releases at that time. Um, and so, yeah, so so we have John Lasseter who get who gets his hand on, on this reel and starts like sharing it with everyone. A- according to him, like uh, part of his like meet cute with his future wife was inviting her and then some other animators home to him to watch this like this animation reel. Um, and uh, he, uh, he 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 would. Uh, Soon after after this, he would actually be leaving uh, Walt Disney uh, Animation Studios um, after like a period where he, he was like fighting to uh, get them on board with more like computer generated uh, uh, animation. He thought that was the future. He got kicked out. He founded he co-founded a little studio you might have heard of called Pixar. Damn. Um, <laughs> and uh, and you know the the rest is uh, is sort of history. Um, but like, so th- this became like the first point of contact and he would later, as I, I think we have discussed it on like the spirited away, uh, episode probably, um, he would be like one of the champions for Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli movies and getting, getting those to cross over into, into the West. Um, so yeah, this, the uh, like really, really big, important moment and just wild to think that 
that was basically like a much much narrower version of of that phenomenon you mentioned of like VHS sharing and the like mm-hmm. because instead it's just like this one animator having this like clip reel at his home that he got animators to check out uh, and and apparently the um the uh, climactic battle in the great mouse detective a disney movie from 1986 is that right yeah, yeah. 86 um is uh is uh, is apparently a, a direct homage to the uh climactic showdown between the the count and Lupin in the castle of Cagliostro which makes sense it's you know takes place in the clock tower uh, and all that uh does and... the bad guy get brutally fucking squashed to death by two clock hands in that children's I, movie <laughs> i believe he pu- he falls to his death screaming but we don't oh, okay. see him landing That's like a like better. the a classic <laughs> the disney death stuff but um, it, it was also, in fact, the I believe the first instance of CG animation integrated into a Disney movie because a lot of the clockwork was uh, was computer animated. So a, a lot of like stuff, like the influence uh, web just spreads out really quickly. Um, though I think uh, it's uh, it's. One important thing to mention here, I, let's just get this out of the way while we're on the subject. Yeah, didn't of, like, Spielberg influence. really like this movie? Uh, it's possible. He, it is po- certainly possible that Steven Spielberg at some point in his life has seen this movie and liked it. However, we do not know. There's a huge, huge rumor that's like even mentioned on the like Wikipedia page and all that. Uh, that Steven Spielberg uh, watched and loved this movie, and even declared the like opening like car chase scene with the uh, with the, the the Fiat and all that um, to be like the the best uh, uh, car chase in cinema history. There is no evidence for this. Like the closest anyone has come is like a blurb on I think it's a VHS cover or something. Or I think a DVD case. release. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that like does not seem substantiated and and all the sources are just like various like um like n- n- nerd flavored news and review sites that just like that are excited about oh spielberg yeah. validated my uh, enjoyment of <laughs> japanese animation damn yeah g- gest- gesturing vaguely at, uh, at at rumors and uh, and inspired by uh, and similarities between uh, th- this movie and uh, the indiana jones films which were already like it, like in like the like uh, conceptual stages when this film uh, like released in any way in the west and besides, like, it's very unlikely that Spielberg would have, like, seen this before making, like, the Indiana Jones trilogy, since it only got a, like, proper release in the 90s. And let's be certain, let's be absolutely clear here. If Steven F. In Spielberg had declared this movie to be a classic and its car chase to be one of the best of all time, we would not only know about it, we would have very exact quotes all over the place and this movie would not be as much of a cult thing as uh, as it is even today so just getting that out of the way sadly no he did not declare it all these things and as uh, as you're alluding to nyad he he doesn't need to miyasaki does not need spielberg's stamp of approval to uh to be like legitimate uh, as, as, as like a cin- piece of cinema, though it is interesting the like sorts of parallels you can find with this film and like uh, Indiana Jones because it it does remind you in some ways like especially with its way of like um, creating like goofy but still tense action yeah. scenes and stuff. Enjoying all these schlocky adventure movie tro- ad- adventure movie tropes, everything. Yeah, exactly. It's pulling from the, some of the same uh, adventure movie tropes, and I would argue that Miyazaki and Spielberg share a, um, a, a a very like some mainstream sensibilities combined with like great artistic vision and a like great understanding of the like action movie action scene basics that uh, that, that makes them have like similar tones and vibes in in this case. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, like the the heroic moments, the big slapstick uh, influences on like minor actions, the cool phrases that characters use yeah. when they you know do something cool, the attention paid especially... to set pieces in the location, all of that. Yeah, I, th I think especially the thing that stands out to me is the way that every action sequence will have like moves and counter moves and complications and uh, and reversals that 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 keep the keep everything like moving very like very smoothly very actively the the hero is not just cool because he gets everything done effortlessly part of the coolness is the the goofiness the moments where like Oh, he he will be like readying for this like really smart setup with a little rocket and 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 throwing it across the uh, a chasm. Then he he will like drop it and and it will fall down and he will run after it and he will have to make a huge jump and have to like improvise from there. That's a very Indiana Jones move. Like you will see Indiana Jones fuck up all the time and have to improvise in tense situations. Yeah, actually, it only just occurred to me. Is Spielberg, again, we don't know if he's actually seen this movie or not. If he has, I would feel like the biggest influence it could have possibly had would have been on his much underrated uh, Tintin movie that he made in like 2012 or something that was oh, yeah, entirely animated. Really good movie. And because it was animated, it allowed Spielberg to do, similar to Miyazaki, these absolutely insane levels, of like complicated chases and these weird, uh, like disastrous sort of um set pieces there's like a great scene where they're riding on a tank that goes down the massive um slope of the, like this italian village and they're going through all these like houses and at one point they just there's a house riding on top of the tank somehow like it's just this unfathomably complicated absurd sort of set piece that feels like if he took any inspiration from miyazaki would would 100 percent have shown up in that movie mm. just uh be, before we move on uh, from this i will I do want to mention that uh, John Lasseter is sadly a less prestigious person uh, than than Spielberg today, especially because he's uh, he got a a accused of a lot of uh, sexual misconduct in the like during the whole Me Too uh, debacle, so around 2017, and he is no longer with Disney, despite being an incredibly su successful producer there. So, uh, I would say it's it's just sad too that that we learned that he had more in common with the uh, monkey punch version of Lupin than the gentleman with the heart of gold we we know in this movie. Wow, what a pull! What a thematic, thematically tying it all together. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's even <laughs> this quote from Monkey Punch, which is a really repulsive quote, but it is what he said. So I'm gonna quote him here. Uh, that Monkey Punch, creator of Lupin III, called Castle of Cagliostro an excellent movie, but uh, uh, he agreed that Miyazaki's vision of Lupin differs from his own. He said, I wouldn't have had him rescue the girl, I would have had him rape her. Let's just Damn. leave that quote there. Jesus Absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It, it, the guy is fucking edgelord and it's the 70s you know or rather the 60s when he was writing the manga let's just say that feminism wasn't very uh, advanced in japan at the time yet i guess if you've seen, yeah <laughs> if you've seen any japanese movie about like crime in the 70s that's totally expected <laughs> it's like really i mean let, let's let's shit. be fair like his like core inspirations like james bond was not a particularly you know female friendly franchise yeah either so yeah definitely uh, incidentally i also have a quote here um where um a, a western uh, a critic from otaku usa described the shift of uh, in lupin stone between the older lupin incarnations and this version as uh, a james bond movie where james bond stayed at motel 6 and his bond mobile was a toyota camry so <laughs> Basically, the idea that as soon as you like unsexualize and take like you know the violence and the crime out of it, you make it boring and lame. Fuck off with that, you know. 
Uh, actually, is 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 it a, is, is it a Fiat that the, they're driving right? Um, so uh, the Lupin car is a Fiat. The Toyota Camry was just like a random car that the quote mentioned. But yeah, uh, Lupin drives okay. a Fiat 500, and um, Clarice's car is a Citroen uh, 2CV, which is interesting because the Fiat 500 is the car of head animator Yasuo Otsuka, and Clarice's car is Miyazaki's first car. So they put their yeah, own cars in um, there. Miyazaki still, I believe, to this day, still has a Citroen uh, 2VC. As we saw, oh. it was evilly chasing them down the road in Earwig and the Witch. We mentioned the slightly Freudian imagery of that. Uh, that was actually really, that was actually really interesting for me to learn because uh, there's another heist movie featuring like specially outfitted uh, like mini cars. I think even Fiat's. Uh, namely, uh, the Italian Job, not the 2003 remake, but the original from 1969. I think it's from. Yeah. Um, well, it was, with uh, with Michael Caine. Michael Caine, yeah. Yeah. Classic movie. The, yeah, it has a really. No, uh, they're they're all driving Mini Coopers because they're Mini Coopers. Yeah, it has a re really Fiat, famous so. uh, so actually, like chase sequence, like where like the... these modified Mini Coopers are just like tearing down the the like the, the in streets. In, and... Yeah, um, I would say though actually. Closer to that, uh, the new Mission Impossible movie, the most recent one, stupid name, oh, yeah, uh, Dead Reckoning, has a... that has a, 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 a lemon yellow Fiat 500 in it, which I refuse to believe is not a reference Damn. to uh, uh, Lupin the Third. Yeah, yeah. But like the, the Italian job connection like is just so specific because I believe they were specifically with modified motors so that they could like do the whole chase thing, the... which is like a very clear parallel here. I, I don't know if there's like this it's just a coincidence and like just two different filmmakers had this fun idea of like what if my little a uh, little mini car for like city driving was actually capable of doing wild car chase stunts yeah i'm not too but, sure if it was big in japan but the italian job is like a classic movie of the time yeah. it was like iconic and influential so it's strictly well, possible unlike unlike the people that unlike the, the people declaring that spielberg said all this stuff about this movie i will not declare without proof that, uh, that the Italian job was an influence here because that would be unethical. S so there. Yeah. So, okay. The Italian connection. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> the Italian the, job the, connection. Ju just mentioning it, like there is an interesting Italian connection with the Lupin the Third franchise to the point that the um, series is so beloved in Italy that part four, the series released in 2015, uh, was simultaneously aired with an Italian dub and plays in Italy and there's a tie-in uh, television movie which is called like the Italian game or something like that um, so like there is a lot of lots of Italy connections in the franchise which I don't know where they started I know like Italy had some of the older series dubbed at some point as well but I have not verified the the, the uh, you know exact time frames when just thought I'd mention it um, to wrap up the cars um, an interesting aspect while we're on cars is that in the original Monkey Punch version and season, uh, season one, Lupin drove a Mercedes SSK. And the reason cited for why he likes that car is because it's Hitler's favorite car. So Miyazaki decided <laughs> that he should instead drive a Fiat 500 uh, in, uh, as soon as he that, took over the first television series. Yeah, that, that's so wild also <laughs> because in The Mystery of Marmo, there is a scene where, <laughs> where he does a Heil Hitler. Yeah, Lupin does. Uh, I I will not even like give the context to to the listeners. Uh, you, you're going to have to be see funny. Can't people take a joke? So, <laughs> so the thing is, Lupin yeah. in multiple <laughs> incarnations of the series fights Nazis exactly like Indiana Jones would. Like kills Nazis, yeah. fights Nazis, uh, competes with Nazis to get like an artifact or whatever. Uh, but also there's other Lupin series where he like crosses the, the German wall, the Berlin wall. But there's other Lupin series where he uses like smartphones and the internet. So it's basically one of those franchises that exists at all times simultaneously. Kind of like, you know, DuckTales. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or like Archer. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, I will say, though, we actually get to see that uh, that original car in the flashback in this one. We see him taking on the castle for the first time. Which I think is also meant to be like a very neat little metaphor where we see the young, wild and reckless Hitler car loving Lupin, who then, uh, after he's almost killed for his like uh, stupidness, uh, is then, you know, goes to more affordable European cars afterwards as he matures. 
I mean, literally, I, did, like almost a decade later, as he's you know grown up. What what wasn't wasn't he, like uh, Adolf Hitler actually like uh, known as like as like a, a sort of a, a gearhead at the very least he had like a huge like interest in like military vehicles and the like. Maybe he, had, he did have good taste in cars. Uh, I don't know. I mean, but uh, you know, I think a ton I, of bad people probably have good taste in cars because that Mercedes it mm. does look cool. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. it, it has, has a certain vibe. It, it's it's pretty cool. Gotta, yeah. gotta, well, gotta give that to it. Uh, he had a good, <laughs> no, good no, no, sense no, 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 that no. one. You, you, you gotta you, hand it to him. You did not, <laughs> you did not under any, under any circumstances, gotta hand it to him. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, okay. So the uh, the movie itself, uh, we're, we're sort well, of like circling towards it. Right? Yeah, let's wrap up the influence part a little bit. I wrote down a couple of more things uh, that it influenced, just quickly rattling them off. Um, there's a reference to the Clock Tower fight in the Clock King episode of Batman the Animated Series. Uh, Gary Trousdale, director of Atlantis, The Lost Empire by Disney, said that the Atlantis scene where the waters recede from the sunken city was directly inspired from the ending of Cagliostro, where that same thing happens. And one of the sequences in uh, the Simpsons movie uh, was inspired by Castle of Cagliostro as Bart Simpson rolls down the roof of the family house. And that is looking exactly like how Lupin is running down the castle roof during his rescue attempt. Um, having rattled this off, a quick word on uh, the Lupin franchise after this movie, just very brief. Miyazaki suggested uh, after he was approached to direct another Lupin movie, he said, no, I'm done with it. Whatever, put him to rest. But he recommended his friend Mamoru Oshii to take over the next movie. Unfortunately, um, Oshii left the production. And even though the film that he started production on was completed as the next cinematic feature, Lupin the Third, Legend of the Gold of Babylon, um, it was with a completely different story and stuff. So we never got to see the Mamoru Oshii, um, you know, Lupin. But it's interesting to read that even way back when uh, their friendship already existed, which would later turn into a weird kind of like rivalry and uh, back and forth and whatnot. And Oshii, of course, for those who do not immediately recognize his name, would go on to be a really, really important influential anime director responsible for, uh, well, most of all, Ghost in the Shell, which uh, aside from Akira and like Spirited Away and stuff, is probably the most influential Japanese uh, animation on Western uh, movie sensibilities. Yeah, it was one of the big like VHS ones that got passed around everywhere and distributed. And then, of course, he did Angel's Egg. Yeah, definitely. Though that was 10 years before Ghost in the Shell. And I guess, um, what's the, I, thank you on the name, Wolf Brigade? Uh, that was Jinro, like very yeah. big in the West. Jinro. Jinro, yeah, I feel like a lot of people. Yeah, that. and in terms of anime, uh, Mamoru Oshii is also known to create the first OVA, uh, uh, Dallas. Uh, and also, he was hugely influential and directed a large part of the Urusayatsu franchise, which is a really core work for otaku, I would say. So, yeah, this guy is friends with Miyazaki. Miyazaki recommended him to do the next Lupin the Third movie. And while the production had started, it was never completed. I do want to know the alternative history where the first thing that Mamoru Oshii directed is like a Lupin movie in 1980 or 1981 instead of, you know, uh, Urusayatsura, I think, later in 1981. Um, I think that's when Urusayatsura started airing. Um, because... His career is also remarkable, and he's a very high contender for, um, you know, us covering a lot of his movies after we're done with all the Ghibli stuff. He's, he's a remarkable auteur of uh, anime yeah, cinema. For sure. Okay, that out of the way. Platon, would you like to give us a quick synopsis? I, I would love to, actually. Uh, so this uh, this movie is a like fairly simple like a uh, adventure romance uh, story, uh, starting out in a, a cold open. Uh, uh, Jigen and, uh, and and Lupin have just uh, robbed a casino blind and are uh, laughing all the way to the illegal banks they will probably be going to or something. Uh, but turns out the um, the paper money that they filled up their Little uh, little uh, Fiat car with is uh, is fake. It's uh, uh, it's counterfeit money, and uh, so they toss it out of the car. Turns out it's not just any type of counterfeit, but counterfeits from uh, Cagliostro. This, uh, as we mentioned, a fictional European microstate that uh, has long been rumored to uh, to be the 
origin of uh, of some of the best counterfeit money uh, in the in the world. Uh, many have uh, have tried and failed to uh, to infiltrate that that castle and get to the bottom of it, including, as we later learn, uh, Lupin himself in his quote unquote younger days. Uh, at any rate, they uh, they head on over that way to uh, uh, to investigate. Maybe maybe second time's the charm for Lupin, but they uh, get interrupted by a car chase that they join. A bunch of uh, weird goons chasing this uh, this lady in a uh, this girl in a uh, wedding dress. Uh, it looks like, uh, and they manage to fend off the goons uh, and rescue the lady. Uh, however, she uh, she flees away from uh, from Lupin after he gets knocked unconscious, uh, leaving behind only a mysterious ring. Turns out this uh, girl is a uh, Lady Clarice, a sixteen-year-old uh, uh, princess uh, of a mostly uh, dead household. Sadly, uh, died tragically in a, in a in a fire. Most of them. Uh, and she is to, uh, about to be forcibly married to the uh, uh, to the evil uh, Count uh, of Cagliostro. I forget his name. Count Lazare. Oh, great, na- great name. Um, who uh, it, uh, who is plotting to take over the uh, the country uh, and is already in, in charge of all the illegal stuff. And apparently, there's a, there's an old legend saying that when their two families like meet together, when shadow and dark uh, and, and light meet, some great treasure will be revealed. Uh, so that's his plan. So he has uh, the Lady Clarice uh, captured uh, in the highest tower of uh, of the castle. And so Lupin obviously decides, I'm going to rescue that girl. I'm going to go do a heist. And the only treasure I'll get is the treasure of a fair maiden rescued from an evil count. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, things that happen in between that plan and the completion of that plan, including uh, Senegata, the uh, uh, the police commissioner, like always on on his tail, uh, who sort of joins forces with him when it turns out, well, well this massive uh, international criminal illegal counterfeiting operation might be a bigger fish to fry right now. So they sort of team up. Uh, of course, uh, Fujiko Mina is there, uh, also trying to uncover the secret of that uh, counterfeit press. And the, uh, yeah, adventure, uh, a, a evil count, uh, a, a fair innocent maiden rescues, daring escapes, Lupin the Third. Lupin the Third. Yeah, they should have played the Lupin the Third Part One music. There's just a guy saying Lupin the Third <laughs> like eight <laughs> <It's a laughs> times. Thing. Yeah, I've, I forgot to mention the uh, by by the end of the the movie, uh, it's revealed that the great treasure wasn't a bunch of money or anything. It actually turns out there's a uh, hidden uh, Roman ruin town city place. Uh, underneath a, this lake that's right next to the castle and was uh, uh, like dammed up uh, through this like aqueduct system. So getting those like the, the, and getting the two special rings from the two families together was what you needed to like unlock that, like, like get the water out mm. and reveal this great treasure to humanity. Yeah. A, Such romance. A treasure for wow. all mankind. And it's too big for Lupin's pockets anyway. Yeah. Do you know what he did manage to steal in the end? Yes, something quite precious. Clarice's heart. <laughs> uh, oh. It's so it's so silly, but also so sincere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has a lot of cheese, but you know, aside from cheese, what it also has interesting things that would occur again throughout Miyazaki's uh, movies and over uh, and like you know, occurred before. For one, the first thing I immediately want to like clock here is uh, the villain, uh, the count. You know, uh, I put him, I put him in direct lineage with, uh, on the one hand, Lepka from Future by Conan. You know, also like in, basically Miyazaki doesn't really do villains, right? Like he does not do bad guys, but sometimes he does, and those are the ones, right? Lepka from Future by Conan, Muska from Castle in the Sky, and this guy, the the count. Those three I would cite as like, yes, these are unambiguously like plotting, 
older men who are like uh, having their, their 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 crafty scheme that the heroes need to foil. And yeah, they, they do not deserve our sympathy at all yes. in any way, which is uh, surprisingly rare in Miyazaki's films. Interesting, especially the point was the sympathy. Not a lot of people die in this movie. Um, instead, like you, you don't like see Lupin like shoot random people or like gun action doesn't usually devolve into you know killing people. You do have a couple of people, obviously, who die because they like fall down and, and get crushed by you know the the gears. Or uh, Fujiko in one scene just kills a dude who tries to take the camera away from her as she tries to film also, the, the scene. The car chi- the car chase scene at the start has a body count. It does have, but like other than that, other than uh, the count being crushed by the clock hands in a big moment, um, very low on the body count. This movie, like. It, very much in the tradition of we have the dramatic high stakes action, but we kind of try to make sure that uh, there's no like gruesome violence or excess of death. And there's even a scene where Goemon remarks, I don't kill senselessly. So there's very much like a through line in here that, you know, potentially only the ones most deserving, like the absolute villains actually die here. Okay, so I think there's an interesting sort of aspect to the way the violence is portrayed. Like it reminds me a lot of Porco Rosso where you sort of have this uh, notion of, like, play, where, like, in Porco Rosso, of course, no one dies. I'm pretty sure, like, everyone is is fine at the end of the movie, um, despite all the plane crashes. But in this, a few people die, but like you say, it's never shown to be, like, super gory or, like, the camera goes all the way out and you don't see a whole lot. But there's this, like, element of this sort of contradiction with the danger or and between how the characters are playing it. Like, all, like all the cast, particularly the Lupin gang, know that they're sort of like playing this game know that their lives are on the line but it's like it's fun to constantly be in danger you know like lupin dives in because he doesn't need the money he wants the adventure yeah uh, they, they've, they've kind of got tone armor like they're, yeah, they and they, yeah. they, they they somehow seem to know it like lupin will put himself right like in like milliseconds from being shot to death by people who want to kill him but it's but he somehow knows it's fine he's, he's got, yeah, got the slight think, grin about it that creates like an interesting tension. Like I think about the scene where, yeah, he's on the roof and he's trying to get the rocket to go over to the castle. And he's just got this like, a, like a completely top of his head scheme to get over there and then ends up fucking up. And then he just like jumps and then like holds onto the outside of a castle. That's like, you know, 400 feet in the air. And he's just like holding on with his fingers to a brick wall. And that's like his plan. I think that's what he goes with. Like this thing would, that would, that would, in other movies, I think he would use it as like this incredibly tense scene where it's like, is he could die any second? But Lupin is just sort of like, oh, well, this is just another wrinkle. You know, it's like he's got to just uh, figure it out. And it's extremely well synchronized with the soundtrack. The movie, too. The, a choice the movie. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I was just saying it, it's also both synchronized with the soundtrack in a very funny way, like reminiscent of Slapstick. Yeah, the, the soundtrack does like a lot of the work here. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I think I think it gets gets back to also like my comparison with Indiana Jones that that, that that's also like Indiana Jones is like a, maybe a bit more violent and like less tame than uh, than this movie, but there's still that element of like you know you, you know it's, it's the same vibe as like Indiana Jones like like uh, punches a really big dude in the face, big dude no sells it, and Indiana Jones has this like oh no what am I gonna do now sort of shrug. Yeah. Uh, reaction it's the same sort of like action comedic action vibe where like yes there's like out of the frying pan into the fire but in like a fun way in like a ooh, how's he gonna get out of this one not oh no he's about to die well there's a a great point that the movie then goes on to make is that lupin does almost die because um oh, yeah. i think in a, in a thing that sort of brings the um brings an element of yeah like maturity and like sort of grounding to the character is the fact that uh, there's a scene where Lupin, he's doing all this running back and forth, he's, like, doing this crazy scheme, but then he just gets shot and is, like, bleeding blood, clearly. Uh, and then Clarice is actually the one that has to save him. She has to, like, fearlessly throw herself over his body, uh, you know, as he's getting, like, shot at. And then she bargains with the Count to, to secure Lupin's life. I think that element is really meant to sort of add this 
not only to give Clarice something to make her not just, you know, an object, but actually give her some sort of like, you know, strength of will and like uh, position in the plot. But also to show that, yeah, like Lupin's recklessness is still constantly putting him on like a knife's edge. And then even though he was so confident, he could still be brought down and it adds sort of a vulnerability to him. I don't think would exist otherwise in the movie. Yeah, well, it's it's also like the second act, uh, all is lost moment before b- before every, the heroes rally the the energy and and and, spe- and and just the structure of this thing is just rock solid fundamental basic like film screenwriting storytelling stuff like just so like uh, really simple and, and and even like cliche as we've been talking about but just executed very well with the cast of characters where like you enjoy them going through this story because it's the Lupin gang going through this classic adventure plot it's it's so it's so simple like uh, like yes he gets shot but he gets shot at the exact moment where he needs to because you need that you need that ebb and flow you need that ups and downs and he heals by eating a lot of food. Oh, he's also a shonen protagonist on top of it, apparently. Yeah, the the, the first the yeah, first Lupin of is them a Saiyan confirmed. <laughs> gets get, gets more tricky every time he almost dies. Mm, gets more wily, yeah. But I do think it does a, it does a good job for like making him seem more sensitive because only after he's shot, we get this scene where he's sort of calmed down and then he explains the, the later part of the backstory with Clarice. Yeah, because he has flashbacks uh, to when he last almost died. <laughs> yeah, uh, trying to get get into the uh, the castle in his quote-unquote younger days when he drove that, uh, that cool Hitler car and was a womanizer and all that. Uh, he got his ass kicked and, uh, and almost died. But a young little... Redheaded girl was really nice to him and uh, and and helped him not die, and that's the connection. That that's why he sort of recognized her, um, in the earlier in the movie, and it all fits together. Better bing, better boom. Storytelling. Uh, yeah, lots of storytelling. But in terms of uh, other things that future Miyazaki works would do, call out or have similarities to. Um, about the interaction between Lupin and Clarice. Um, Interesting. I I am reminded of the interaction between Porco and Fio. Even though the roles are quite different, uh, Porco and Lupin are basically... uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm forgetting something, but they're the only adult protagonists Miyazaki ever used, right? Uh, Jiro in the... True! I forgot one! Okay. Also, I... I don't know how old your man is in Princess Mononoke. I guess he could feasibly be a teenager. Yeah, no, he has the whole... He's a shonen guy with the unclouded yeah. eyes thing going on, you know. He he is a bit more mature looking, but definitely from the writing perspective, more like a brave boy than anything else. Yeah. But 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 even even that aside, they do have a lot in common in terms of being like uh, old school adventurer types who have like the, their younger days are behind them and they're like doing uh doing daring uh adventure things and have this relationship to a a younger girl who is like sort of involved yeah the younger girl who's like sort of into the older guy but the older guy is like nah it's never gonna work you know i'm just gonna be your mentor and an influence on you and i'm gonna wistfully you know appreciate you as the young brave uh person who will have a future not me i'm the old cynical fuck you know uh, that's basically uh, the the relationship that's going on there. Even though this Lupin is very cynical, right? Like, if if there's one thing to be noted, it's that Porco is like a lot more an old man than Lupin is because you know, Lupin in this movie is I don't know, like about forty. I think that's the implication. And Miyazaki directing this film is thirty eight. Um, and later with Porco Rosso, obviously like over twenty years. Well, not over twenty years, fifteen, sixteen, something years later. Um, an older man with an older sentiment and an older protagonist who is more cynical and more f- fed up with the world, you know? Yeah, I didn't make that connection until you just made it now, but yeah, because um, there's a good quote from um, Miyazaki in uh, Starting Point where he says something along the lines of, like, L- Lupin had run out of steam. Like, he couldn't imagine going back to Lupin and writing a new, L- new Lupin story at that point because he thought, you know, he'd sort of, like, uh, done everything he could and he couldn't see him advancing more but 
If anything, yeah, Porcaroso feels like the closest Miyazaki came to returning to Lupin of any sort of, yeah, this adventure with these past glories. Yeah, we got to respect a, a filmmaker who refuses to do a sequel. But, and that he definitely does. I mean, this is the only case where he's actually done a sequel, right? Like, because it's not a sequel to his own work, but like, he has worked on Lupin previously and other Lupin movies exist. So this is definitely a case where he has kind of made a sequel, but he refused to do again in at, at every point, basically, in his career, right? So there's, yeah, lots of standalone works. But more words on the relationship to Porco Rosso and, and this movie. Like, Theo is an interesting comparison point to Clarice because I think we see a shift gradually in how Miyazaki writes his female characters. This era right here, Clarice has moments of, you know, moments where she like takes the chair and tries to break the window, which are kind of out of character for her because otherwise she's like a really, she is a damsel in distress character, period. Like there, there's, that's what she is. She's innocent. She's nice. She's kind. She's a nurturing girl, but that's it. But like right after yeah. this, the next movie Miyazaki would direct has Nausicaa, like a very, very different kind of uh, character who retains like a nurturing quality, but also has insane agency, like combat ability, adventuring, exploring ability is really tough as basically the hero. And yet somehow basically the same haircut. Yeah, basically the same haircut. Like they look super similar. But what, what I find interesting here is like the evolution of the, the female characters in Miyazaki. We kind of have Fujiko here as well, who interestingly enough has a very different role from how she is usually used in the Lupin franchise or like at to this point uh that's a very charitable way of saying uh she's not showing her tits out in every scene so she used to show her tits out in every scene either by way of being a manipulative seductress or by way of being an actual damsel in distress so like there was always this dynamic of fujiko being captured and being like tortured by some villain who like fondles her breasts or something um, I think that's like even in episode one of the first Lupin series, there's like a weird like tickling machine with like weird hands and they're like fondling Fujiko. Oh yeah, I do remember that. That is a weird, <laughs> that is a weird choice. To yeah, <laughs> so that, that's the one side of the coin. So Fujiko uh, as technically a woman with a lot of agency because she's like a master thief and a seductress and she constantly foils Lupin's plans and she's like an antagonist in a way, but Lupin doesn't hate her because she's into her. You know, that's the dynamic they usually have. And in this movie, she's not a foil. She is doing her own thing. Uh, she has a mission there. She's competent at it. She's infiltrated the place for a while. When she, you know, breaks out of the mission, instead of, like, getting her tits out, she gets into a military outfit and starts, like, shooting with, with an assault rifle and doing all kinds of military combat actions, you know. It's all, all, all of that is not her style in any of the other franchise incarnations. And in a way that I'll probably get into uh, later when we talk more about Fujiko's role in this movie, um, removing her sexuality entirely doesn't sit right with me either like that's definitely also a weird framing to the character where Miyazaki may be overcorrected in the direction of you know uh, removing sexuality from her personality in ways that weren't necessarily needed in that extreme hmm. but that's that's so you, th you think maybe yeah. you think maybe she she should have been like seducing the count into giving her access to places stuff like that um it's more like the femme fatale has a mixed reception in like uh, media, Hollywood and so on. But there is an element to agency of a woman who is like dangerously in control of her sexuality and can use it like, like mm. a thief who can break into places to, you know, manipulate people and so on. So there's been a lot of discussion in feminist media discourses about the femme fatale specifically. Like, is it just a male fantasy? Like the, the male detective, the noir detective who is supposed to, you know, win over the femme fatale and defeat her and punish her for her deviant sexuality? That's like a common trope. Or is there like more where female viewers of cinema could identify as character and feel empowered by a character who like is capable of uh, using her exploited role as a woman in this society to you know manipulative or effective ends in some way you know and Fujiko always writes that line which is which leads to an interesting part later in the franchise when um, uh, Sayo Yamamoto uh, a female director by the way and Mario Okada a female writer um, take on the franchise writing a series from the perspective of Fujiko Mina in the woman called Fujiko Mina which is like a weird meta on, you know, how Fujiko has been written throughout the history by different men to fulfill different fantasies, including Miyazaki's version, which is like a neutralized version because, I don't know, Miyazaki considered 
Fujiko's sexuality dangerous to him, where this series instead opts for a very feminist approach of exploring the agency of the femme fatale through different, you know, really interesting episodic plots where Fujiko embodies different roles. But I'm getting sidetracked because that's one of my favorite series. It's it's really good. I would say, though, something that's interesting purely in the metatextualness yeah. of it is that um, originally Fujiko as a character in the original manga run was just several different women characters who just Lupin was sleeping with or got in his way, who Monkey Punch just called Fujiko as like sort of like a, a you know, a, a Jill or a Jane, you know, just a throwaway name, but then decided to collate all those characters into one woman who could sort of do anything. It's like there was a character in, in the Bond movies just called Bond Babe, and they kept re reoccurring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pre pretty much. Yeah, and she appeared in every every movie. So yeah, I think it's interesting that, like you said later on, the franchise would go on to literally explore the way that Fujiko has all these different facets to her and how she's written in all these different ways. Yeah, but enough about Fujiko at this point. Like, I could recommend the woman called Fujiko Mino for everyone interested in like a, a, a really surreal, psychologically vivid noir thriller thing exploring like the franchise from the perspective of Fujiko Mino. It's really good. Um, getting back to female characters and how Miyazaki writes them, right? I was uh, developing the point that up to this point, the works Miyazaki was involved in with his female characters. We have, um, of course, the, um, the the girl in Panda Ko Panda, who is really upbeat and like uh, sporty and like, you know, fit and physical uh, uh, all, all the entire time. This is kind of more how we imagine the Miyazaki heroine that he would get famous for later, like strong-willed, you know, self-directed girls. Um, Clarice is literally like like a damsel, but like her virtues of like purity and innocence and so on make her similar to uh, uh, Lana from Cast in the Sky as well. So like gradually, bit by bit, we see the Miyazaki girl from these innocent, um, um, relatively helpless. I want to say relatively because that's not quite fair that they're completely helpless. Relatively helpless girls to more proactive and active girls that are, you know, the driving force of the movies. And uh, yeah. yeah, I definitely see that as uh, the starting point uh, for Miyazaki's female characters right here. Uh, and we shift away. Oh, right, because of the yeah. book. Yeah. And we gradually, in Miyazaki's canon, shift away from brave boy protagonists to brave girl protagonists. It's kind of uh, what happens. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's interesting how like Clarice is, like as you say, such a textbook damsel in distress. Like We, we won't get anything as simple as this until, like, Princess Peach. Um, yeah, but, I will say uh, a note for context still, for, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, this is the only movie Miyazaki's ever made where he wasn't the only person running the screenplay. Uh, Yamazaki Haruya, if I'm saying that right, um, also wrote the, the script and is credited for the screenplay of this. And he appears to have written like a lot of TV adaptations, like a lot of uh, stuff at the time typical of like Lupin and like adapting manga so I'm not sure there's like no details in the production of who had the most influence over the script like we say this is very clearly a Miyazaki project in a lot of ways but I mean who knows how much influence uh, Yamazaki had and like shaping it to be a more traditional Lupin style adventure you're saying maybe maybe she was more feisty before uh that guy got it. I mean, on. I'm saying like, we, we don't know how much we can truly accredit to Miyazaki's writing choices. I mean, maybe. we do, kind of. In my sources that I've read, um, it's pretty clearly stated that while that co writer did make suggestions, that Miyazaki apparently ignored almost all of them. Like, it is. Another person has worked on the writing here, but Miyazaki clearly helmed the operation to the point that, you know, it is remarked upon how little uh, he, Miyazaki, you know, kind of respected uh, uh, the other writer's contributions. Uh, to, okay, to the point that. where we're referring Sorry, to them yeah. as the other yeah. writer most of the time, because they, they don't even have a Wikipedia page, nothing. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't mean much. <laughs> so, Lots of old anime guys don't have uh, Wikipedia pages. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. yeah, got your point. I'm, I'm joking around. Well, what I was getting at is like, for, for how typical a damsel uh, Clarice is, somehow, like, it. I think the character just works. Maybe it's just that the... The whole movie just embraces its genre so much. Like the the count also works, even though he's like the most simple, like evil bastard you could imagine. Uh, Clarice maybe works in the same way, but I don't know. I I feel like the ways in which 
all other parts of the story are so much less innocent th than her sort of gives her like innocence a sort of a sort of power a sort of uh, agency in itself like her, her her strength is not in her ability to escape but but it but she does demonstrate a certain strength when she like lays her body on top of Lupin's to, to, to keep him from being shot. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's, there's a sense I get that like, it, she, she still somehow feels like a real character and not just a trope. I, th I think um, the way that it works yeah. is because it reminds us of the romanticism of the gentleman thief idea in the first place, because, you know, even though uh, the original Lupin the uh, Third from Monkey Punch is a reference to the Maurice Leblanc uh, Arsène Lupin novels uh, and and stories, it, there is not not a lot of similarity. Like what characterized Arsène Lupin in the original old stories is the idea of a gentleman thief, right? Like he is kind of like a good guy who does things with so much style and charm that you know, even though he is obviously a criminal and does like crime to you know for whatever his own sense of justice is, um, he does it with remarkable, you know, suaveness, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word. And Miyazaki brings that back, I want to say. Like, he he changes how Lupin is in order to evoke this romanticism. He doesn't want us to think of the thief as someone who, like, does it out of interest in material gain and, like, hedonic pleasures, but someone who does it for, like, the adventure of it, for the romanticism, who intervenes to help the girl. And the girl... Clarice in this case and what makes her feel so powerful to to you know the viewers is how she seems to be the peak reader of this romanticist story she sees the, the, the thief and she has like teary eyes misty eyes like oh shit the Mr. Thief uh, please save me you know and it's like because she desires the romanticist fantasy of that gentleman thief and in that way she's like an audience stand-in for for us that's at least the feeling that I had. because we are watching this we want to see lupon do the heroic thing he want to see lupon save the girl we want to see lupon be the suave cool guy who doesn't you know get his hands dirty but instead solves things with like style and uh wit yeah i i completely agree because um she yeah she works well as an audience sort of surrogate as well because like uh it's a uh... It's a world full of like driven adults, basically. Every other main character in this story is like an incredibly driven and almost obsessed in their own sort of uh, narrative adult from the Count to Lupin to Fujiko doing her own thing, you know, just like not really caring about the consequences of anything else. Everyone's sort of got a mission, but like Clarice is merely, you know, just this sort of innocent person where all this stuff is just happening to her. And she ends up, you know, getting wrapped up in, into it. And like you say, she throws herself on top of Lupin as this big moment defining her as like someone who wants to, uh, you know, do the right thing. And then in the end, yeah, like you say, like like the audience, our hearts are stolen by Lupin by the end, and so is hers. You know, we're we're uh, we're in love with this this uh, enigmatic thief character. I, th I thought that the ending was so like so nice the the, the way that she like obviously like fell so fucking hard for him, which I mean. He, he he like he made that happen like he, he knows what he was doing come on but still he has this like he's enough of a like gentleman and, and a mature like adult person to be like no this is not right that like you you gotta live your life uh quick a quick little uh you know the tender you know a, a kiss on the forehead and a, and a goodbye and that's uh, that's all you'll see from me I, th I think it's really sweet uh and like and, and also a sort of a direct uh like basically a counter to the lecherous asshole we uh what one might have been familiar with um back in the 60s and 70s because we're talking about it so much um, I think we really need to shift our attention to uh, the theme of Lupin growing up, uh, because wow, this is like the central theme of the of the of the movie. Let me just frame it for a moment. So, in the previous incarnations, we have this uh, Lupin the Third, who is a cunning, a lustful thief. We see him, you know, uh, engage in sexual harassment, sexual violence uh, here or there greedy theft you know stealing from jewelries and breaking in places and cruelty and all of that 
And um, what happens in this movie is we actually get flashbacks to moments like this. For example, when Lupin uh, remembers his past, you actually see shots that were like shot for shot in the first season, right? Like the scene where he uses a vacuum to like suck up uh, jewelry from a from a display in a jewelry jewelry store. That's in the first season, but also. Uh, the famous shot uh, where he's like hit by the spotlights and running away. That's like a shot from the opening of, I think. That's also a reference to Tintin, I, I think. Uh, that's a very I iconic, at least from the Tintin like uh, TV show, which I don't know if it's younger than Lupin, but it's a clear parallel. Yeah, I don't know, but... Uh, at least it's a very famous shot in Lupin that keeps being repeated throughout the franchise's history. Like Lupin is there in the spotlight. He starts running with the big grin on his face. And the interesting shift that happens here in this version is that we see what happens after he runs heroically from the spotlights. He gets shot in the back by spears, you know? Uh, so you have this this movement of taking the most iconic Lupin shot and, uh, you know, depicting how he gets shot after it, you know? It, it is not a moment of heroism where he, like, gets away with it, but a moment where he fails, where he's, like, almost fatally wounded and in need of help and desperation, right? So... In the visual storytelling here, what we have is an explicit engagement with the franchise history and like in like, like a reversal, like Lupin is remembering it with like a kind of shame. Uh, Miyazaki describes it in for this movie that now Lupin's actions are not really motivated by superficial things such as money, jewels or women, but instead that at the base of Lupin's soul, there swirls a rage towards the machinery of society that suffocates humanity. And he tries to bury the falseness of his heart through spurring himself into action. He is fighting to give his life meaning and is yearning for someone who can lead him to that fight. And that is Miyazaki's words on his transformation of Lupin, right? Instead of someone who is like obsessed with hedonism and fills his ennui riddled life with like a life of crime... What he is doing crime for, and this is how we get to the big gentleman thief idea, is um, he does crime to bring good, right? He wants to have a meaningful fight, which is why when he sees the girl being chased down by a car, his decision is, I need to help the girl. I need to bring good into this world. And when he figures out that this girl is the one that, you know, saved him back in the day, this savior, this person giving him, uh, giving him you know, water despite how potentially dangerous he was. Like, the idea that someone would care about him, obviously something that spurred a maturing. Something that, while he kept being a thief, uh, someone who is committing crime, who is ostensibly doing, like, in quotation marks, bad things, he's now a good thief. Like, the gentleman thief. Chaotic good, you know, whatever you want to say. The guy who breaks the rules to fix when a system is being unjust. And we see that in this movie, because the public, the UN, is literally shown... Uh, when uh, Zenigata approaches them, says, well, we found the forgery, the, the counterfeit money is being made here. All of the UN nations say, well, no, we're not going to do it because of political reasons. We'd rather infight about the politics of the situation than do anything against, you know, this bad person who's about to have a sham marriage with the, uh, with the girl that Lupin is trying to save. So we see Lupin having to spur into action to stop a corrupt and unjust system uh, from, you know, harming an innocent girl. And that's the transformation Lupin underwent f from Miyazaki's perspective to, you know, make him the person he is in this movie. Someone who grew up and who rejects who he once was. Yeah, there's quite an interesting um, little scene. You could argue this isn't even in the text of the movie because it was in the script of the original dub, which makes quite a few changes, like we said. But um, there was a very interesting line that I felt illustrated this where uh, when Lupin's like lying down and Clarice sees him for the first time and goes, I tried to turn the charm on her, but seeing as she was like about eight years old, it didn't really work, which I really <laughs> like as a illustrating that like Lupin literally his first thing to do was, you know, use his sort of womanizing ways to get what he wanted, but like it didn't work. Like, so he had to sort of almost uh, see this innocence in the world for the first time that he'd sort of forgotten, given that he was just, you know, like a murderous thief at that point. And he had to like, yeah, he had to grow up and in that maturity understand that there's sort of an innocence and there's sort of like a, a niceness to the world that he didn't previously ever really pay attention to or was too busy doing other stuff. And like, yeah, he grows from that and appreciates Clarice to, as her own person. And like in the end of the movie, yeah, even though she is like, I guess technically of marrying age, he still like knows that it's, you know, sort of wrong. He wouldn't like... 
he wouldn't want to involve her in his life. She should like be separate from him. I don't know, Dan. Uh, I don't know how well versed I am in the in the age of consent in the microstate of Caliostro, but uh, it's, I a, get it's what a European you're nation, so it's got to be low. Just, <laughs> you know. well, let's just say it's a European nation, so uh, the sixteen-year-old Clarice at the end of the movie could totally have dated the thirty-year-old Lupin, but they didn't. So, like in terms of European laws, that's how it is. Good decision. Very good decision, and that is like how the movie ties it all together, right? Like the idea that the womanizing Lupin at the end would recognize now this girl, I don't want to pull her to the life of crime. I don't want to break her heart. I, I can't be the one, uh, you know, who, who, who has a relationship with her. I'll just say goodbye and tell her I'll save her when she needs me. So this is like mm. how the gentleman becomes fully actualized, right? Like the idea of you cannot have like depicted gentleman and then the gentleman fucks, right? Like that doesn't come, that isn't compatible. He's like someone who's like tastefully disappears in right the climactic moment when the woman longs for him the most. That's like the romanticism of it. Right. I think that's also like what one thing that might seem like a weakness of the movie is like the lack of act of like character arcs. Because I've talked about how like rock solids, like the, the, all the story beats are and the, and the action writing, but the uh, the fact of the matter is like the characters don't really go through much of an evolution throughout the movie, but yeah. Other than perhaps like Cl Clarice, but that's like part of the the genre that th these are uh, iconic characters. They are not supposed to change over the course of the narrative. They are supposed to be extremely likable yeah. to make up for that lack of even, change. Even further uh, than that, really are, but right, yeah. like because uh, the 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 loop on the third season two had 155 episodes set at different times uh, with different adventures mostly episodic plots not like on a building on top of each other no linear plot episodic right so the formula was very much the sitcom formula of you cannot have anything dramatically change at the end of an episode you need to reset the next episode needs to start with the cast as they were as they always will be so what uh, Miyazaki does here is something pretty uh, intense. He has a character who is already changed, right? Like there's no arc in this movie. You don't see the story or like we don't experience the story of Lupin maturing. The standout moment here is that it is a radical break with how this kind of franchise usually works in that he has already changed and he's reflecting on you know, the TV series that literally aired yesterday, you know, uh, that showed him just still being the guy that, that he once was. So that, that that is the feeling that I have of, like, really strongly breaking with the sort of structure such a episodic series has. Yeah, you know, the James Bond franchise has, like, be, come on a lot of extra scrutiny in the, uh, in the 21st century, especially with, with regards to, you know, colonialism sexism all that stuff they they should take they should for for, for the next one they like the uh, whoever they cast and uh, and whatever direction they they should take a look at this movie and see how you can like keep the iconic parts and uh, and just just have like a, a, a bit of an, an evolution just have a have the character and the franchise grow up uh, a, a little bit it's uh it's not as hard as it looks well, um, also back to the comparison with Paul Garoso, I think it's funny that Mizaki decides to end that movie with all the uh, the, the the bandits and everyone on the seaplanes uh, being just like old men that sit around all day reminiscing about the times they used to be cool adventurers. And that's almost his view of how these things turn out. Because like he says, he felt that Lupin was running out of steam when he was directing Lupin. So, you know. Yeah, that, uh, was, that was decades uh, before... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, before Poco. Well, about about a decade actually, like, like thirteen years or something. Mm, I think Poco Rosso was like what nineteen ninety three, nineteen ninety six, um, nineteen ninety two. Okay, yeah. So yeah, thirteen years. You know, interestingly enough, just from time perception, you know, it's been longer between Horus, Prince of the Sun, and Castle of Cagliostro than it has been between Castle of Cagliostro and Poco Rosso. Uh, that's just just a weird thing to think about. Yeah, they really got into gear in the eighties and nineties with Studio Ghibli, but uh, but that is for episodes of future past.
Yeah, true. Uh, it's, it, um, it, I, I was yeah. wrong anyways. I can't even do math right. In 1968 was Horus and 1979, so that's 11 years. But it's like about the same time frame. And it's noteworthy how how intense Miyazaki's career got between this Castle of Cagliostro and uh, Poco Rosso. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Nausicaa came out in 1985. So... Damn, that's an intense few years between Nausicaa and, uh, you know, I, I wonder if, if a cool podcast has covered that time extensively and, you know, ha had insights. Into the... Anyways, <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about Lupin. Just, just a few observations about the Lupin growing up stuff that I still want to bring up because they were interesting. Um, the old uh, Lupin was often, you know, hedonist. He had a fancy Mercedes. We already talked about how the car was downsized in this movie to a Fiat. Um, there were also other details like good food, like fancy clothing, fashion, and so on. It seems that in this movie, there was explicit attention to, you know, the relative relative poverty of uh, the characters being made here, relatively speaking, of course. Uh, like Jigen and Lupin fighting over like one plate of spaghetti and uh, Lupin struggling with a disposable lighter in one moment where he tries to ignite the rocket and, you know, the disposable lighter fails him, the cheap plastic thing, right? So um, some of these details were noted that the arsenal of Lupin really isn't, like, really sophisticated high-tech stuff. And his, you know, entire brand seems to have shifted from expensive watches, expensive cars, expensive lighters and whatnot to cheap, poor, basic we you back to the roots. And this entire visual shift is probably best exemplified through the car. Because instead of a fancy car, he has like a basic everyman's car. Literally the first car of Yasuo Otsuka. Like, like a, an affordable car that isn't too fancy, that gets really beat up in the course of this movie. And, you know, what a strong little trooper. It uh, breathed its last breath in this movie as it fell apart completely after the chase sequence. <laughs> it's just <clears throat> the, the notable attention to detail in terms of the props, I want to say. It's not props because, you know, it's drawn. I mean, yeah. you, you can use that. Same with locations. <clears throat> yeah. Like, they're not actual locations there, but yeah. The prop work, the production design. Yeah, yeah. so we have a lot of that. Um, in terms of Lupin, I'm basically through um uh, with the character uh, unless the two of you still have like just like Miyazaki yeah. was a hey. I mean yeah that that is that is oh, worth you, you mentioned the poverty though I will say um it, I, I do like the ways the movie shows the, the count being this like rich bastard like the sequence where he's walking and doesn't stop as his servant is undressing him from his flight soon oh yeah that's a great just gag. like a great use of animation but also one of the rare times we see this again, like not fully evolved, you know, uh, Charizard level Miyazaki, but like we see the um, the one uh, flying machine in the uh, in the movie is actually used by the bad guy, and even though it's a very dinky little, very neat Miyazaki style helicopter, it's uh, it's used by the forces of evil, so that's pretty rare for him. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, Jiren even like say like, oh, how old school a gyrocopter or something. Yeah. It's like very uh, anachronistic, but also I guess it's you know symbolically the the count is above everyone. Like literally, he lives in a gigantic castle and mm. just can fly over all the traffic and all the roads. Yeah. Uh, also, one thing with regards to like uh, Lupin's characterization, there's that early scene in the diner with the spaghetti where he like jokingly calls himself a womanizer yeah. and, and, and and like flirts with the waitress, but it's clearly like in a like non-threatening sort of like I'm, I'm just like kidding around sort of yeah. tone with it which i think would think was interesting like in a yeah i, I wonder what the original what monkey punch would have to say about that so interesting you should mention that um i think a good way to wrap up the arc of lupin growing up basically is uh, uh first miyazaki um who talked about um that there are lots of different interpretations of a character he basically, uh, and I'm paraphrasing more or less, that if there are 100 people, buyers or creators, there are also 100 different Lupons that exist. And when the opportunity came around that he had to create his own version of Lupon, all he could think was the image of Lupon that lived his glory in the 60s and early 70s and now lives in regret and shame for his young and wild life. And following that, a quote from Monkey Punch. 95% of Lupon the third fans outside of Japan cite this work as what triggered them to become a fan. 
I said, this is not my Lupin. It's a very good work by Miyazaki-kun, wrapped in kindness that I couldn't have drawn. My Lupin is poisonous. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, we didn't sit around for two hours talking about something poisonous, but instead something really cool and fun and nice <laughs> and just all around well made. Yeah, so if you will entertain me in the next section of this podcast, I kind of do want to go through the, the main characters one by one and just briefly talk about kind of what Miyazaki did to them, changed to them, what was noteworthy about them to me in terms of the franchise history as it was and as it would be later on. <clears throat> I can speak from the position of someone who has seen a fuck ton of different Lupin things, and by far not everything, but I kind of want to chronicle what was the starting point from which Miyazaki took these characters, where did he take them, and in what way has that left a lasting impression on the franchise? Because I think that's a pretty interesting way to go about this. Uh, I take that as agreement. Yeah, to, to take us away. <laughs> go off, King. So the first one, Lupin, we covered extensively. Um, kind of thinking about, not just about what Miyazaki has done, in terms of the franchise, I think Miyazaki's Castle of Cagliostro Lupin is the Lupin that we have now. Um, there are, well, of course, uh, throughout the 80s, 90s, and there was a huge return of Lupin franchise in the 2010s with like three new seasons uh, airing over the 2010s and uh, early 2020s, and many new movies, uh, CG ad adaptation of the of the franchise, and multiple um, different takes on it through different cinematic adaptations. Um, it seems that Miyazaki's approach to this and the idea of 100 Lupins still lives strong. The default Lupin, I want to say, is the adventurous gentleman thief depicted in poverty, you know, with his friend Jigen, just, you know, going where cool adventures where they can save someone and do good things for society exist, right? Especially the three modern series, part four, part five, and part six, uh, are the other seasons, all feature, you know, Jigen and Lupin crashing and like run down hideouts and like driving not very impressive cars. The they they maintain the Fiat as like the franchise's iconic car, even though you know the original is a Mercedes. So all of these things that Miyazaki had an influence on have remained as part of Lupin, but notably. Sometimes uh, uh, directors show up because the series has been touched by countless directors at this point. It's kind of like the amount of TV specials of feature lengths, like 90 minute TV specials that have been made has been kind of a trial ground for so many different anime directors. Even Osamu Dezaki directed four of these um, and other like key animators uh, who got really famous later, like Hiroyuki Imaishi from Goran Lagan and Kill la Kill fame um, had like a huge key animation roles in uh, at least two or three uh, Lupin specials, stuff like that. So lots of different people had their hands on it. And uh, some incarnations, um, like the Takeshi Koike movies, which um, are like um, 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 Goemon's uh, Blood Spray, Jigen's Gravestone, and uh, the bomb called Fujikamina and Fujiko's Lie. Those are all like in a cinematic universe of turning Lupin more noir, more mature. And I already talked about the woman called Fujiko Mina as this feminist take on the franchise. The Takeshi Koek movies are more like the dark, edgy, noir version, which never gets as bad and I want to say tasteless as the Monkey Punch original, but definitely decides to take the franchise in a more mature direction. So as always, there keeps being this meta of the character shifting depending on which tone the director wants to take. But Miyazaki's version has one over history. I think that can be fairly claimed. Um, so much for Lupin. Um, with Jigen, it's pretty interesting because Jigen, um, in the original and most of the older works and as a running gag throughout the franchise, is known to be someone really skeptical of Lupin and women. So like Jigen is the guy who goes, uh, Lupin, you can't be serious. Like Fujiko again, are you really going to get, you know, fucked over by her again? So like he's kind of like a misogynist in like the way that he knows that whenever Lupin gets involved with a woman, it's going to turn out bad. Notably, that is not at all present in this movie. Like he seems to be the most changed to me in terms of how he usually is depicted in the franchise. And this change has not been maintained. The change here is that Lu uh, Jigen is kind of just a cool guy who's like friends with Lupin. They have like playful moments of like, 
joyfully throwing the builds together, like playing rock, paper, scissors, deciding who gets to install the spare tire. Uh, Jigen's also 100% on board with Lupin saving the damsel lamp, and Lupin doesn't talk to him. Jigen goes over and is like, tell me, dude, what the fuck are you hiding from me? Uh, let me help you. So he's a good, good, nice dude. Jigen usually is a lot more stern and stoic and inwards directed and is is kind of misogynist. And that's in in a way where it's like a fun thing because you know Lupin is a womanizer and Jigen is fed up with the trouble that causes usually. Um, so yeah, Miyazaki's version of Jigen did not stick around because in my honest opinion, it kind of does lose some of the profile that Jigen's character has. He, he is just kind of like Lupin's friend. And that's his character, right? Like, at least that's my impression of his role in this movie. Um, maybe even worth with Goemon. Goemon, the samurai who shows up, uh, he has more complicated roles throughout the franchise. Here in this movie, he kind of shows up as a joke. He is like the samurai who has like the cool sword moves and is really stoic and shy around women. The, that's all, basically. Um, it isn't like part of his backstory that he wants to kill Lupin? Some for some yeah, reason. originally he was like an assassin sent after Lupin, but they kind of uh, got, became friends and collaborators in the very messy first season. It is complicated, um, but yeah, in this movie okay, he's but, just so, a, so it's it's more it's more shown in protagonist stuff with like oh the villain turns into a an ally and now we're just hanging kind out. of and and I, but I mostly think he's like a reference to samurai movies for obvious reasons right like he's a stoic guy who's like perfect with his swordsmanship but extremely serious and disciplined and um in this movie he's the, he's a joke uh, his his best scene in this movie is when he uses his sword to uh cut Lupin out of his flaming clothes <laughs> and it's like what what happens there so Miyazaki's interpretation of Goemon is just like a samurai joke kind of stuck around, but most other incarnations give him more personality, more complexity, especially with, her, with regards to uh, the, you know, idea that he's shy around women, which is often explored, you know, through women befriending Goemon and him opening up and uh, showing more emotional vulnerability on account of that. Okay, Goemon uh, checked off the list. Fujiko, we already talked about a bit. Um, here I get to the point where I was saying kind of like there's a bit of criticism to be had because... In The Woman Called Fujiko Mina, what they do is they look at the history of how Fujiko has been written by different writers. And in a sense, they make the point that through her sexuality, she has agency. She is a thief, not because she's like a poor, traumatized woman or like whatever, but because she wants to be, because she endorses this lifestyle and it imbues her with like the, the full agency over her own body. Um, the idea that like a male author like Miyazaki decides that, no, it's too risque. We can't have her be seductress. Let's have it be... Yeah, cool, military lady, boom. That takes away from her defining traits, which the franchise has brought back. And it is hard to write a femme fatale in a way that isn't terrible. And sometimes the franchise nails it, sometimes it doesn't. So as an overview of how it goes on later, my take would be the quality of the Lupin the Third uh, thing, series, franchise movie, or like TV feature can be measured by how well-written Fujiko is usually. And I would say in Miyazaki's movie, she is well-written. Uh, there is like a minor point of complaint from me that it's like, if you take out her sexuality, you kind of, yeah, you, uh, you know, make her less about her body. Cool. But also you take away some of that which defines her agency in better uh, depictions of Fujiko. So period. Right. Right. Well, time to get down, down to brass tacks. Zenigata. Zenigata. Yeah. Too sexy? Oh, my God. What what happens to <laughs> Zenigata in this movie is beautiful, and it's my favorite dynamic in the entire series. Like, Ooh. Zenigata usually uh, is an adversary to Lupin in a cruel sense. He's a cop obsessed with wanting to, you know, do uh, Lupin in. And the original has Zenigata be as lecherous and nasty and aggressive and violent as Lupin is. There is always an underlying implication between Lupin and Zenigata that what Zenigata really enjoys is the chase, not the catch, and that there are even in the first series, like an episode where Lupin pretends to die in prison to get to break out because Zenigata gets really sad about Lupin pretending to having died in prison, stuff like that. But in this movie, their dynamic is really, really, really expanded. So if, if Lupin is the chaotic good thief who sees the ills of society and tries to, you know, break the system to get out, Zenigata is also kind of a good 
cop, right? Like he wants to do the right thing. He wants to catch Lupin. He works at Interpol. He sees a crime. He sees the bill counterfeiting. And he, as an institutionalized cop, is unable to do anything against it. And this is why he teams up with Lupin, because in this moment, his job of catching the thief is less important than working with him to fix the bigger ill in society. And this is a dynamic, this you know, cat and mouse game where Zenigata is often a collaborator with Lupin in specific cases because he recognizes that Lupin wants to do good things and also who enjoys the thrill of chasing Lupin so much as a meaningful thing in his life that he will often let Lupin get away as like a thing of like, okay, you helped me, I'll let you get away now, but I'll catch you, Lupin, see you next time. This dynamic, which I think most strongly comes through in this movie, is retained throughout the entire franchise, and it's one of my favorite things. Uh, it's always a highlight when Zenigata and Lupin collaborate both together. Zenigata realizing that as a cop, he cannot change the system and needs to, you know, join Lupin in working outside the system to, to solve some issue. And that's just a beautiful thing that this uh, movie really strongly builds upon and, you know, forever leaves its imprints on the franchise as a whole. Yeah. And that's my takes on uh, Zenigata, right? Like there's also the quote of Lupin, don't you dare die before I catch you, uh, where he's worried about Lupin, all of that stuff. It's it's just really high quality. And in terms of the important characters, that's all the characters that reoccur throughout the franchise frequently and how they've been, you know, depicted and changed in this movie. Yeah, it, it, it's really cool how like uh, with someone like you who has <clears throat> such a deep knowledge of the of the franchise, like how you can see that Miyazaki, even before becoming such a household name, already has this huge influence on a like smaller like cultural institution of uh, uh, of Japanese media, but obviously would go on to like create much more iconic things on his own. Just steps into the franchise, uh, introduces and and rewires things that that would like go on to influence the series for like all of time and then like refuses to elaborate yeah. and leaves uh absolutely <laughs> incredible incredible stuff um I, I think that also like uh might, might be a, a time to like just give our like final thoughts about this thing because one of my final thoughts is this this is not a masterpiece of uh, of animation of of, of like uh art and creativity it's a fun romp and it's a very very fun romp and a very well animated one and you can absolutely like see the that that there's someone who absolutely masters the, the the craft of like cinematic storytelling and animation behind it who has some great great works in their future uh but i would not count this as among miyasaki's uh, greats uh, I, th I think that's not going to be too controversial a take. Hip, so you want to take over at this point? <laughs> no, I just wanted a plate to sort of sit in silent judgment by the <laughs> two of us. Uh, no, 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 uh, I agree. Yeah, it's like a, it's a great classic style adventure movie that Miyazaki obviously nails in all the technical ways you'd expect. But perhaps because it was also a franchise, like we already say, he dramatically transforms a lot of the characters for his own style but even he himself says he sort of found it restrictive and wouldn't return to the series and like he had to of course go on and like we said like he wouldn't ever have anyone else write a screenplay with him because like you said he just fucking disregarded everything the other guy said so he figured i don't ever need anyone to write a screenplay with me again yeah true control and he would go on to make his own more radically interesting movies yeah, like they, yeah, this was this was like this, uh, like we said, um, him getting like some experience working inside the industry. He had to be a control freak and make his own studio after this. He had no other choice. So as for yeah, no, be yeah, a great as, movie. Everyone as for my it. take, uh, I also think it's a great movie. Um, it is helped by the fact that I am like a fan of the Lupin the Third franchise outside of Miyazaki's involvement in it as well. Um, and I'd rank it in like my top three or top four uh, loop on the third things next to the woman called Fujikomino, which I've already mentioned, and especially uh, season five, so part five, which also incidentally 
has a subplot dealing with the idea of who really is Lupin? Why is he wearing so many masks? Do we really know this man? There have been so many Lupins throughout history. So like it's a franchise really, really strongly engaged with its own metatextual, you know, development of the characters and uh, Castle of Cagliostro is, is one of the best ones uh, in doing that. In terms of Miyazaki's oeuvre, is of course, like, uh, you know, this movie may be like a 9 out of 10 or whatever for me, but like there's so many 10 out of 10s in there that... What can I say? Obviously, it's not in the top five because <laughs> it's difficult, <laughs> you know, it's fucking hard. But yeah. um, I, I think it's I think it's great how like this the, we're seeing with this film, like Miyazaki working under a ton of restraints and already existing franchise, uh, a tight like production schedule and uh, and a lot of like a uh, lot, lot of requirements, not a lot of uh, freedom out, outside of it. <laughs> and yet the Miyazaki in this movie is like bursting out of it uh, if they're through all, through all the cracks like in the, in the setting in the backgrounds in the thematic interest in the like flying machine that's not necessary but super cool anyway it's just he he you can that that's i think that's what i'm i'm i'm, I'm getting at when i say that like you can feel the this you know master filmmaker at work like who has so much like potential and and will do so many things in the future because you you can't really hold him in like you put him in Lupin and Lupin changes yeah. uh, along with it and just to really wrap that up um the, the the final reveal of the movie is that the real treasure that was hidden by the two rings is not like gold or anything material but the Roman ruin, as you already said, Platon. and what I find remarkable is Lupin reflecting on that and being like happy about this, that what he discovered was a treasure for all mankind, too big for my pockets anyways, like really suggesting the idea of a thief that Miyazaki has here uh, is not really, you know, he doesn't want to steal it, but he was in it for the mystery, for the revealing of, uh, for the stopping of the evil doing, and for, you know, now the world has become richer. And remarkably, tying this into Miyazaki's oeuvre, um, the ruins consumed by nature, an evocative piece of imagery that, you know, throughout his work, keeps popping up you know civilizations destroyed uh rolled over by nature or forces of nature in conjunction with ruins flooded cities stuff like that that you know you keep seeing again and again and it's not worthy that it is also in here so mm, yeah it's also also interesting how the very similarly to those roman ruins Hayao Miyazaki would turn out to be too big for L Lupin oh yeah and with that, uh, let's talk about what's happening next in, first of all, Miyazaki's career, because, you know, as we don't talk about TV series here, um, it is worth noting that between this and Nausicaa, he goes on to direct an interestingly uh, somewhat similar and comparable TV series to this Lupin movie, uh, because he adapts uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, as the series Sherlock Hound, where anthropomorphic dog characters uh, inhabit the roles of, you know, John Watson and Sherlock Holmes and, and so on and so on. And the, the evil Moriarty. Wait, hang on. Did, did, I, I was mentioning The Great Mouse Detective yeah. earlier, which is another 1980s Sherlock Holmes adaptation with talking animals. You know, there's a lot of... There's a what lot of weird those. <laughs> Yeah, but still, still weird. Basically, still weird. everyone has adapted Sherlock Holmes at this point. But yes, point taken. Yeah. Point taken. Um, it's also um, interesting um, because it's a Japanese-Italian co-production. So the West got much sooner into contact with uh, Sherlock Holmes than they did with other Miyazaki work. And uh, this is maybe where the Italian connection begins. Who knows? But uh, it's cool that Miyazaki, like, back-to-back -back adapts, uh, like... Uh, Maurice Leblanc's uh, Arsène Lupin and then uh, Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes because, yeah, like those two had like an interesting uh, legal dispute for a while uh, where Maurice Leblanc was not allowed to name a character Sherlock Holmes despite wanting to have Sherlock Holmes in the story. So he like names him Herlock Holmes or something stupid like that. Um, very fun stuff, but let's not get too deep into this. Uh, we will not be covering this series, but it's worth knowing that it exists. Instead, what we will be covering next is a film co-written and directed by Takahata called Jaringo Chie, or translated as Chie the Bread, um, which is a little-known film which uh, had relative success in Japan, which led to the creation of a follow-up TV series, which 
coincidence, coincidence, when next month we will release our episode on Jardin Cochier, for the first time, Discotech Media will uh, release a Blu-ray version of the translated Chia the Bread TV series, also directed by Takahata. This timing was not planned. It is a really surprising timing. It is really cool. Oh, well, what? What? What the hell are you talking about? This this was absolutely planned. We've been pulling strings with all that Patreon oh, yeah. money. Listen, li listeners. If, Some backroom uh, deals with yes. distributors. <laughs> listeners, <laughs> if, if you want official releases of uh, obscure works, classic works by famous uh, Japanese uh, animation directors, keep, uh, keep listening, keep supporting the cast. We promise absolutely 100%, no joke. There will be more coming. You know, we'll make it happen. I promise. But yeah, it is wild to me that Jain Kochie, the TV series, was untranslated, even through piracy, even though I would never do it. Uh, it was untranslated up to this point, and it is now in 2024, like 40 years after its initial release, uh, uh, finally getting a release in English. That's wild to me. But yeah, we'll not be talking about the TV series, but about the movie, which was so successful that a TV series was made. Um, so stay tuned for next time. In the meantime, if you want to reach out to us, uh, join our Discord server, link in the description. You can also uh, send us other forms of communication like money through Patreon uh, on patreon.com slash Narsicast. And of course, um, that's all of the things that I remember to say in the outro. Thank you very much for listening. Yes. See you later. Yes. Goodbye. Fa farewell. And, and, and remember, the, the greatest treasures are in fact the ones that you can't have in your pocket. Brew!